Hello, and welcome to this Themis web webinar, Modern Slavery in a Digital Age. As the topic suggests, the problem of slavery, forced labour and human trafficking are very much 21st century problems. I think the most recently published statistic states that one in every 130 women are living in conditions of modern slavery. But as our panel will explain to us today, there are some 21st century solutions to this crime. By using technology to detect signs of modern slavery, we can also disrupt the traffickers which thrive from this lucrative and exploitative practice. We can also use technology to prevent people from falling into modern slavery in the first instance. We are very lucky today to be joined by an expert panel on this topic from a variety of backgrounds. And so I'm now going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves in turn. Um, so Nick Dale, if you wouldn't mind starting by summarising your background in a few short sentences. Um, good morning, yes, thanks Henry. I'm, I'm Nick Dale, I'm a superintendent with West Midlands Police. Uh, I'm currently the police lead for a national project, the National Data Analytics Solution. Uh, we're developing the capability for advanced data analytics for policing, um, the challenge of ingesting data, applying data analytical tools and techniques, and providing insights to drive operational activity. We're doing this around a number of different threat types, from serious violence to firearms and modern slavery. Uh, modern slavery is an area of particular interest of mine, uh, as I was the SIO for uh, the senior investigating officer, I should say, for Operation Fort, which was a rather large and complex uh, labour exploitation investigation that started in 2015. Great, thanks. Nick, and I think you're being a bit modest there because I understand that Operation Four is the largest modern slavery investigation in the UK so far. Um, oh, that, that is right. Next, um, Leanne, I, I like others to say it, not me. <laughs> Good on you. Um, Leanne, if I could ask you to introduce yourself now, please. Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Leanne Melnick. So I'm the head of human and labour rights at Diginex Solutions. So we partner with governments, international organizations, and the private sector to see how we can build technology-based solutions to combat modern slavery. So today I'll be touching on a few of our different projects um, that are actually powered by blockchain technology to drive greater transparency and accountability um, in global supply chains and primarily looking at the international labor recruitment process. So my background is very much in labor rights and migration. So I was the forced labor expert at the International Labor Organization um, for about 10 years, and then worked a lot with uh, global supply chains here in Hong Kong with one of the, the biggest um, Hong Kong-based manufacturing companies. Um, and I think one of the things that I'll try to bring in today is a bit of the, the Asian perspective, um, since Asia Pacific remains one of the regions with the highest prevalence rates for modern slavery. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Leanne. And finally, Florin, if you could introduce yourself, please. Yes, thank you. And good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Florian Ostmann. I'm the policy theme lead uh, at the Alan Turing Institute. The Alan Turing Institute is the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. It is also one of the partner institutions within the Modern Slavery Policy and Evidence Center that was launched earlier this year. I'm a member of the public policy program within the Institute, where our work focuses on two areas. On the one hand, we are thinking about how data science and AI can help address societal challenges. On the other hand, we spend a lot of time thinking about the ethics and governance of AI and related technologies. And in the area of modern slavery, uh, we have a number of projects. I'm currently leading a project that is focused on uh, the role of investors in addressing modern slavery risks in the private sector and the role of data um, in enabling investors to play that role. And I'll, I'll say a bit more about that project later on. Great. Thank you very much, Florian. OK, so the panel is going to speak for around 35 minutes and that's going to leave plenty of time for a Q&A session at the end. Um, if you look on the right hand side of your screen, there's a little panel and if you pop that out, you can enter any questions you might have and we're going to try and get through as many of these as possible. Um, but first, um, when we were uh, preparing this webinar, we noticed there's quite a lot of technical terms and we wanted this to appeal to as wide an audience as possible. Uh, so firstly, I think just to sort of gauge um, the sort of level of knowledge we have and also hopefully to give you, the audience, a bit of an understanding of what we're dealing with. Uh, we wondered if you'd like to understand digital terms a bit better. So if we can move on to our first poll. This is going to be which digital, which digital term would you like to understand better? Uh, big data, artificial intelligence, blockchain, cryptocurrencies or your digital experts and we don't need to worry about this. If you have a quick vote now, 
And in the meantime, I'd just like to explain a bit more about what Themis is doing to combat modern slavery. We're currently going, working through an outreach programme for our project, A Call to Action, where we're seeking to alert um, the financial sector in particular to the very real modern slavery risks they face and help engage them in tackling the problem. If you would like to help with this project, you can help us by signing on to Themis's website and answering a short questionnaire. Uh, our website is www.crime.financial and it's forward slash MSHT to get to the relevant section on modern slavery. Um, great, I think we've had most people have been able to vote. Um, so if we could see what the results are now. Okay, so blockchain seems to be pretty much half the audience would like to know, know a little bit more, but I'm very pleased that 8% are digital experts as well. That's good to know. Um, so Leanne, would you mind explaining quickly a bit about what blockchain is? Um, so when we're discussing it more, we can understand it a bit better. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember actually when I started at Diginex and I had a 70 page paper to read on what is blockchain and I, I actually skipped that part, but it's okay. Don't worry. I do actually, I can explain it. Um, so blockchain just in its, in its simplest form is essentially, um, a type of distributed ledger technology. Um, that's basically a fancy way of saying that data is stored in different nodes or different capsules. Um, and it basically ensures that records of a transaction are immutable, meaning um, you can't change it or irreversible. Um, so it basically enables what we call trustless transactions um, and it also secures multi-party sharing and verification of information without the need of having an intermediary basically help that process. The reason why they call it a, a trustless process is essentially because of that multi-party verification that creates a single set of truth between different parties. Um, so in a nutshell, it's what I'm looking at here is what you're looking at. Um, and those parties can be anywhere in the world, um, but essentially they're able to see the same thing at the same time. Um, and you don't need to have somebody sitting in between and facilitating that sharing. Um, the other really kind of important thing to know about blockchain is really about that security. Um, so we're gonna be touching on that later in the webinar related to this issue of data privacy. Um, but you guys may recall that some of the big airlines, for instance, have had you know these hacking schemes happen into their centralized databases. And that's one thing that blockchain offers is the security because information is stored um, in that decentralized manner, which means that there's essentially these perimeters around kind of mini capsules of data that um, makes it a lot harder to hack. Um, so it's really, I mean, the key aspects for modern slavery for the conversation today is really that that multi-party verification, single set of truth, and the security um, that comes along with um, with the data security, but also the security of knowing things haven't been changed or altered without a record of that change sitting on this uh, this ledger, which is immutable. So that's Thank you. Well, that, that's certainly a lot more than I knew about blockchain. So that's really good to know. Thanks very much. I think that's been very worthwhile. Um, thanks, Leanne. OK, so we're going to move on to our first question now. Um, so this is looking at the sort of data points you're going to be looking out for. Uh, when you're trying to understand modern slavery and human trafficking. So Nick, you're currently working on the National Data Analytics Solution. This is a project that uses advanced data analytics to tackle policing priorities. Um, so could you tell us a bit more about the key data points that you're looking at when it comes to modern slavery and human trafficking? Yes, of course. So um, when, we, we, when we started running this proof of concept around modern slavery, we looked at uh, the data for West Midlands Police. Um, there are uh, 2.4 million people within within our data. There are a number of different sources of data, and this one particularly focuses on um, our main sources of data, which are crime reports and intelligence. And as you can imagine, there are with those 2.4 million people, there's a number of different crime reports, intelligence reports, multiple reports relating to the same people. Within those reports, there are links between people, and the the, the challenge was really to identify a particular threat type from in all of that data, to surface that threat type so that um, we could strategically understand the threat type and to operationally tackle the networks involved. Um, and so what we did in order to, um, to meet that challenge was to essentially train the model 
to identify cases of modern slavery and human trafficking within the data. So it would take known cases of, 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 of those crime types, identify what sort of language was used within those reports, and then read every, every single thing within our, within our data to identify that language, bring it to the surface. So that then brings those events to the surface. Those, so, so they may not have been recorded as modern slavery events or flagged by a human operator as a modern slavery event, but when the model, when, when the tools look into the language used, it identifies them as, a, as an event. Ben, so what would you've got the would you, would you would you say Nick? Say again, sorry, Henry. So those those events which the um the data system is picking up, what would what would those be typically? So th 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 there might be something which is, for example, a uh, an intelligence log which is which is marked as antisocial behaviour, um, which is linked to um, potentially people who work, women working as prostitutes, for example. If, if when that's recorded, the officers don't either identify or understand the exploitation um, w within that scenario, um, they might record it as antisocial behaviour in the street that's affecting the, the neighbours without seeing the bigger picture. What this allows us to do is to see the bigger picture by, uh, by identifying the sort of language that's used within there. And, then, and then, it's, then it's about forming those connections so you identify not just events, but you identify network. So the people linked to that event, um, let's say, for example, it's, it's an, an intelligence log relating to a particular address and women working at that address as, as prostitutes. It may well be that there are people managing um, that address and other addresses. And then you see what I mean? You start forming the, the networks and start understanding that network of um, exploitation. So what you're able to do there with all that is from the, from the real granular um, data, you're able to understand the prevalence and uh, of your threat type, so you can understand how many potential cases of modern slavery you've got across, say, a force area. You can start to understand the typology. You can start to break that down by location. So in a particular location, you might have that sort of sexual exploitation. It might be labour exploitation in another area. And then you can drill down into that to start to understand the network. So, okay, if in this area we've got sexual exploitation as a problem, which, who are the individuals involved within the networks that are leading to this, this, this threat? And then you can start to um, understand the networks to, um, to, to sort of disrupt the activity of the network, to safeguard the victims, to target the offenders, to dismantle the organized crime groups that are, um, that, that, that are sort of leading to this threat. Great. Okay. Well, thanks very much. That's that's really really interesting. Very succinct as well. Um, Florian, could I bring you in here? Because I understand that um, at the um, Alan Turing Institute, you're looking at um, how investors can be impacted by modern slavery. And I just wondered about the role that data-driven approaches play can help play in reducing investors' exposure um, to um, in, uh, modern slavery. Yes, yes, of course. I'll, I'll, I'll say a bit more about, about this project that I mentioned earlier. Um, as mentioned, it, it's a joint project um, under the umbrella of the Modern Slavery Policy and Evidence Centre uh, that we're working on together with colleagues at the Bingham Centre and the Rule of Law. And the, the starting point or the motivation for the project is the assumption um, and the premise that investors have an important role to play in addressing modern slavery risks. Um, but at the same time, often struggle getting the information that they need to effectively exercise that role. Um, and uh, that data can play, play a crucial role in, in providing that information. Um, I'll say a bit more, perhaps briefly, about sort of the scope of the project and how we think about the different ways in which investors can be affected by modern slavery or, or linked to modern slavery. Um, since traditionally, in thinking about investment, uh, issues related to modern slavery, the focus tends to be on forced labor, primarily in uh, emerging market settings. And so often there's a focus on supply chains um, of Western companies that reach into emerging markets or investments in uh, direct investments in companies situated in emerging markets. But the issue is, is much broader than that. And we're trying to capture that with the project. So we're trying to um, do justice to the fact that modern slavery can occur in any market, um, you know, including in uh, companies that are, whose operations are located, uh, say, in the UK, and you know, there's no lack of, of evidence uh, for that happening. Um, and secondly, we're trying to um, take into account that 
monoslavery can occur both in the production of goods and services, and that often tends to be the traditional focus if you think about supply chains, but it can also be um, related to a company through the use of goods and services. Um, so, for example, the use of uh, financial services to facilitate human trafficking or the use of transportation services um, for trafficking purposes. So we're really trying to adopt a very broad lens and, and cover all possible connections that may exist um, uh, in, uh, that, that companies may have in relation to modern slavery and that may have therefore be of relevance to investors. Now, the other thing to say is that from an investment perspective, these connections can have financial implications. Um, and that's, of course, one reason for investors to care about them. Um, but, but we're not limited to that perspective of financial um, materiality, materiality, as it were. And we're really sort of starting from the premise that as a matter of responsible investment, um, these risks should be uh, taken seriously by investors and should be addressed, um, you know, regardless of their financial um, implications. So that's the, the scope of you know, the sort of the problem space that we're thinking about. Um, when it comes to the role of data, um, given that we're trying to adopt this broad focus, um, once, once you adopt that focus, you see that there's a vast range of, of data that could be relevant to help investors understand where modern slavery risks exist and how companies perform in addressing them. Um, traditionally, there's been a focus on information published by companies. In the UK context, of course, modern slavery statements are primarily published by companies. Um, but there's data published by a range of other um, data producers um, that can be relevant. And that includes criminal justice data, it includes um, media information, worker voice data, customs information, for example. So, so that's the first challenge is to think, you know, try, try to think about the broad range of data sources and, and try to think of a way of, of bringing them together um, and, and enabling their use. Um, the other challenge is that um, modern slavery, of course, is just one issue in the broader context of human rights due diligence and, and ESG investing. And so there is data that's focused specifically on modern slavery, and then you have data that's more broadly focused on human rights and ESG. And so another challenge is to, to make sense of that, of those connections and, and, and integrate the thinking um, and the duration of insights about modern slavery um, into a broader insights uh, regarding human rights and ESG. And then the final challenge is, is uh, around data that is unstructured. Um, so a lot of data comes in a structured form and investors, of course, traditionally are used to using structured data, but um, a lot of data that's relevant in the context of modern slavery tends to be unstructured, tends to be free text information. Again, modern slavery statements are an example for that. Um, and so there are interesting questions around how information can be extracted from these unstructured data sources um, and made useful to investors. Great. Well, thanks very much for that. So I think that's a really, really interesting um, um, analysis of how investors can do their bit to help end modern slavery. And I think, you know, the Boohoo case in particular has really shown the role that investors can play in stopping these poor practices, even when they um, in some of the sort of more flagship companies. Um, we've talked a bit about sort of using um, data to spot signs of modern slavery. Leanne, I'd quite like to bring you in here and ask, can we use data to prevent modern slavery? Um, I know particularly we were talking earlier about blockchain, that how this could be potentially revolutionary here. Um, so would you be able to tell us a bit more how data can be used to prevent modern slavery? Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess the first caveat is that um, Blockchain is revolutionary, but I'd say only combined with other forms of technology and honestly still probably having really good people on the ground who know what they're looking for. Um, so I think, you know, there was a lot of hype about blockchain when it came out and I think that's that's died down a little bit. Um, but I think what we're seeing now is this um, this combination of, of blockchain being used for those key purposes of transparency and security combined with other great technology tools out there to give us, um, I, I'd say, what could be a more continuous picture of what's happening on the ground or in those workplaces where you could find modern slavery. Um, so I definitely hear Florian's point on the uh, the unstructured 
form of data. And I think um, that's one thing that we've been looking at here at Diginex. Um, so we've partnered with um, different um, private sector partners as well as big organizations like International Organization for Migration um, to see how can we really start to um, A, collect different data points related to modern slavery, um, but also provide greater transparency and trust between different parties in the international recruitment process. Um, so the journey started in 2018 when we partnered with a, a small NGO called Mekong Club um, here in Hong Kong. And um, we started to ask the question of, what were the barriers that companies were facing um, when they were addressing modern slavery in their supply chains? Um, and we we very quickly saw that um, most companies still don't have sufficient data on their workforce, um, and they don't have sufficient visibility over the international recruitment process. So we know that the international recruitment process um, let's say for workers going from Bangladesh to work in the hospitality industry in Qatar, that um, you're crossing two different jurisdictions. Um, so oftentimes you have parties on both sides um, and that the employer will often only see what the recruitment agency is telling them. And on the other hand, you have the worker who is also only telling them what the recruitment agency is telling them. So you have this person standing in the middle and it's a little bit, um, I think the word for it was Chinese whispers or that chain where you have something that starts at one end and what comes out can be something that's completely different. Um, and so we, we, we said, can we use technology to basically um, allow all the different parties to understand what's happening at the exact same time while having brands or retailers or, or perhaps the supplier being able to connect directly with the worker. So how do you a, dis disintermediate that process to allow a much more direct connection between the business community with you know, the key players in that workplace who may be at risk of modern slavery? And how do we make sure that all of those key documents, um, like the contract, like the visa, like the passport, are stored in one place, um, and then that's visible to all parties, um, obviously with the appropriate um, you know, viewing and permissioning in place. Um, so that, that was a project called EMIN um, that we started. And essentially the, the contracting piece, which allows the worker to upload his or her key documents onto a blockchain um, and to have the, the employer, the recruitment agency, and the worker basically sign on to that at the same time, um, eliminates the, the risk of contract substitution. Because what we had before that was the worker may sign a contract in one location, and just before they're getting on the plane to go to their destination country, they're given another contract in a language that they don't understand, and they're told to sign that. Um, so we eliminated the need, the, the risk of contract substitution by basically upfront having everyone agree on the same version of the contract and allowing that process to take place early in the migration process. Um, so basically it started with that and it's um, very much branched out into other areas now um, in, in terms of using blockchain also for grievance um, because that's the other area that we see is that there's a lot of, um, you know, Grievances often happen on companies' private compliance systems, and there's no one really overseeing how those cases are being managed, how, like, whether they're actually being resolved um, in the right way. Um, so actually having that be a much more multi-party system of grievance and accountability um, basically helps ensure that the outcomes for those workers are, um, are equitable. Um, and then just the last point that I wanted to speak on was um, in terms of the direct worker engagement. Um, so one of the things that we built into EMIN quite early on was a, um, a worker engagement part of that platform where the employer was able to connect directly with the worker when they're still in the origin country. And we were able to collect 35 different data points in under six minutes from those workers. And I think that really kind of plays into 
what I see as the biggest kind of blank spot in addressing modern slavery through data right now, which is collecting good information on on the workforce. Um, because definitely for forced labor or labor exploitation, um, there is a lot of information out there in the public realm that relates to modern slavery, but it's very, very kind of high level data and it doesn't necessarily give business the tools that they need to be able to make actionable difference in their supply chain. Thank you, great. Thank, thanks, thanks, Leanne. That's that's um, really in, really some really interesting points there. Um, Nick, if I could bring you in here now. I mean, we're talking a lot about data and you know its uses for good, but obviously, you know, everyone has access to data in some way, shape, or form. Um, so, are we seeing criminals using digital means um, to fuel their labour exploitation schemes? Um, yeah, so I was just reflecting on what Leanne was saying, actually, and it, 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 it's really, it really resonates. Just before I get onto that, if I may, it really resonates sure. with, with the, with the, um, with, with the experience of victims, because, because that, that, those documents, that, that contract, and all of that is, is kind of power. And if you can give any of that power back to any potential victim, you know, it, 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 my, my investigation, we had a, we had a member of the organised crime group embedded within a recruitment agency. So all of that, the, the, the ID card, the, the national insurance card, the, the, the documents are all processed by this one individual. So if you can take that away, I think that's really powerful. But, um, but sorry, I'll answer your question now, Henry. No, 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 that, so, that's, that's, that's fascinating to hear that. So it, it's, it's a really interesting thing about the, 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 the power of these technologies, and obviously they can be used for harm as well as good. And we are seeing, I mean, still this is a largely cash business, right? There's, there's people making a lot of cash and moving it um, around the country moving it back into different com uh, countries so it's largely cash-based business but we are seeing an increased use of uh, cryptocurrency to launder and move the proceeds of of this crime um that seems to be increasing now and with covid related um tra travel restrictions it seems that people are using more technical means to um, move their cash so whereas my organized crime group might put uh, a suitcase full of cash onto the Eurostar and uh, it will end up back in Poland. Um, it may well be that they'll choose to use um, Bitcoin or, 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 or similar cryptocurrency now in order to move that cash um, quickly. But it, we are in the early days of, 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 of that sort of transition. But there's, I think there's um, two points to make there which are really interesting. First of all, I'll talk about Operation Venetic, which although it doesn't relate to cryptocurrency per se, I think is um, a good example of how law enforcement then catches up with the, the, the criminals in using this technology. So what Venetic will have seen in the news, how sort of international law enforcement cracked the crypto code on, uh, on, 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 on phones that were a sort of digital enabler for organized crime. So this was an international activity. The NCA was involved at local and regional levels as well in this country. These were criminals who obviously thought they were untouchable and they could go about their business using this encryption. Um, but that was in turn decrypted. And obviously we, we saw in the news there were hundreds of arrests made across Europe, um, hundreds in this country actually, charges, two tons of drugs, you know, dozens of firearms recovered. You can, you know, I, I, don't get me wrong, I'm not an expert in cryptocurrency, but I can already see the sort of signs that the ability to track this um, the, 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 the currency by law enforcement will be starting. So that kind of gives us a, a, a little bit of optimism. And of course, the second point is around about confiscation of um, the proceeds, because even if that currency is, um, you know, tr transferred securely and we can't, we, we can trace it. This is all about, you know, organised crime is all about money. It's all about um, being able to enjoy the proceeds of it. So at some stage these criminals will want to um, enjoy the proceeds, invest it in, you know, holiday homes or yachts or whatever it was it is they want to invest in. You know, the, the confiscation order, which we can secure under the uh, Proceeds of Crime Act, um, lasts for life and actually beyond death as well. So um, and any any asset that a criminal has can be, can be recovered as a result of that. Um, so it's quite powerful legislation. We do need, I will you know, sort of kind of, going back to the data-led approach, we do need an efficient and effective way of, 
of, of tracking these things and we need the financial investigators and we need the analysts to be able to identify these assets but it should be possible to kind of identify the asset on the other side of the um the, the move that the, the sort of secure movement of the money that the funds if you like thank you that's that's really interesting nick and um yeah a, a point for future discussion definitely um so florian going on to the, the work you're doing looking at big data blockchains and cryptocurrencies um you know the other big thing we we're looking at in this um sort of um data set is um artificial intelligence um so could you perhaps share with us some tangible examples of how machine learning and natural language processing which are forms of artificial intelligence can be employed to spot signs of modern slavery and human trafficking yes yeah thank you um so i think uh Broadly speaking, it's worth distinguishing two types of applications that, that we've seen and that we've partly worked on. So the first one is the development of uh, tools for decision support. The second one is the use of natural language processing or image recognition for analyzing data um, and making unstructured, going back to the earlier point about unstructured data, making unstructured data um, uh, accessible for, for, for data analysis. So I'll say a bit about both of those categories. Um, for decision support tools, there, there are essentially, I think, two main uh, applications, types of applications that are relevant in this context. The first one is the prediction tools um, case. Um, so that's broadly speaking, the use of models to make predictions, uh, say predictions about risk, uh, predictions about the prevalence of modern slavery in a particular context, um, predictions about the vulnerability of, of individuals um, and so on. The second case, in addition to prediction, is uh, that of detection problems. So that's a you know the case, for example, of trying to identify instances of suspicious activity, um, trying to identify uh, perpetrators, um, and so on and so forth. Now, for those kinds of uh, decision support tools. Um, they would essentially perform tasks that can also be performed by simpler models, uh, models that are developed you know, using traditional statistical techniques. But what machine learning uh, allows us to do is to develop models with greater complexity um, and great, a greater number of, of, of input um, variables. And so as a result, that, that can lead to significant improvements in the performance of these, of these models. Um, so an example, you know, another example would be the detection of uh, financial transactions that may be linked to bond slavery or human trafficking, um, the analysis of online uh, adult services ads, that's another project that we're working on and trying to identify how likely it is that a particular ad is linked to, to sex trafficking. Uh, rather than voluntary um, uh, provision of services. So that's the decision support case. Um, and then in addition to that, there is this other broad area around um, analyzing unstructured data using either natural language processing or computer vision. Um, the sort of the parad paradigmatic case of unstructured data, as mentioned, um, is either um, you know free text data that you can find in maybe police reports or in uh, survivor testimonies um, or in modern slavery statements published by companies or it could be images um, you know that photographs posted on online adult services um, ads for example and nlp you know traditionally you needed humans to to look at these materials um, and the amount of information the amount of text or images often made it impossible to analyze them for humans and so nlp and image recognition allow us to um, automate that kind of analysis um, or you know rely on machines to support the analysis um, and that can can make a big difference um, so again in the online um, adult services ad context there have been successes for example in analyzing images um, and identifying, for example, cases where images of different um, individuals were taken in the same hotel, in the same hotel room, um, you know, and that provided evidence that they may be, um, you know, there may be a, a joint link, they may be victim of the same uh, trafficking um, operation. Um, there are also examples that a project currently um, supported by the Mineru Foundation and uh, the carried out by the Future Society, 
trying to automate the analysis of modern slavery statements published by companies and using natural language processing um, in that context. Um, and then there are prominent examples um, of projects that look at satellite imagery, for example, um, uh, to shed light on, on uh, sort of indicative patterns in the fishing industry, for example, the movement of fishing vessels, um, or a project that's looking at uh, sort of images of brick kilns um, from a satellite perspective and identify um, indicators of risk um, in that context. So those are just a few examples, but again, broadly speaking, there are these two categories, decision support and, and analysis of unstructured data that I think are, are the, main, the main use cases. Great. Well, thank, thanks very much, Florian. That's, that's, um, that's really, um, yeah, some great talking points there. Um, and we're going to leave 15 minutes for um, questions at the end of this. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes left um, with our panel here. Um, so I think before we go into that, we're going to do a second audience poll. Uh, based on some of the discussions, because I think the next bit of the um, of the webinar, we're going to be talking about some of the problems associated with using technology to fight modern slavery. Um, so I think on this poll, if we can get up, what do you think is the biggest issue that arises when new technology is used to fight modern slavery? Is it unauthorized and insensitive use of data, bias and lack of transparency, um, solutions imposed on victims without their understanding, uh, costliness of technological solutions, or how do you indeed prosecute based on algorithms? Um, so if you could vote on that now. Um, and so in the meantime, please do keep on sending your questions. We're going to endeavour to get through as many of them as possible. Uh, and I'm sure, as you can see, our, we've got a very knowledgeable panel today um, who should be able to provide some really sort of unique answers to this, which I think you'd be unlikely to find elsewhere. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit longer to vote. OK, great. That looks like we've had most people voting now. So if we can go to the answers. OK, so one problem we're already seeing is a bias and lack of tra transparency associated with AI. Florian, would you mind coming back on that quickly um, as a potential issue dealing with artificial intelligence? The issue, sorry, I didn't see the poll, bias and lack of transparency. Sorry, sorry the poll, so 38% of our panel have come, of yeah. our, our audience have come back saying that one of the concerns they might have in using technology to fight modern slavery is yeah. that potentially an AI system might have an inbuilt bias into it. And so on is there can be a lack of transparency associated with how it's collecting the data. Um, yeah, is this yeah. something you, you tend to find when you're looking at um, using AI solutions? Yeah, I think there are, there are certainly important concerns. I think there are ways of addressing them, but it's very important to address them. And so one important, I think there are, there are slightly separate issues. I mean, there are important questions around bias that can either relate to the quality of the data that is used to develop a model, um, or the data that's used during the inference phase, it can also relate to the way the model is, is tweaked and tuned. Um, and then there's the separate issue of transparency and to what extent are we able to understand how, how the model works. Um, perhaps to, uh, to go into a bit more detail on the, on the transparency question, because I think it's, it's a very important one. Um, there's an often, you know, often discussed potential trade-off between the performance of models um, and they are interpretability or the extent to which we're able to understand them. It's not always clear that that trade-off exists in practice. I mean, often it's possible to achieve um, sort of high levels of performance with models that, that are easy to understand. But in so far as the, the trade-off exists, it's important you know, to think carefully about whether um, sort of the increase in performance that you can get from using a, a particular complex modeling techniques is worth the risk of not being able to properly understand how the model works and as a result not knowing where the weak spots of a model model are and the uh, uh, you know a particular concern that that we've encountered in some some of the cases we've looked at is the issue of concept drift or model drift um, or model deterioration over time where you know and that's particularly relevant i think in the case of modern slavery um, we're dealing with a phenomenon that's very context dependent, context specific in its appearance, and it can also change over time. You know, human trafficking operations, you know, adapt in their form to, uh, you know, law enforcement responses, for example. And so, as a result, um, you know, a model that may be very effective at detecting, um, you know, or predicting risk factors um, at a, at one point in time may lose that ability if you don't monitor it properly and if you don't understand, you know, what it, what its weak spots are, or Similarly, if you transfer a, a model that was developed, you know, uh, to to predict risk um, and has successfully done, 
in a geography A, you transfer that to a different, you know, region or different country where modern slavery may take a very different form. Um, you may you may be left with a very poorly performing model, and so those those are some of the reasons why I think you know being able to understand how the model works and understanding its weak spots are very important in this context. Great, thank thank you very much, Florian. Um, and Leanne, just just to bring you in here, I mean, certainly looking from a sort of Asia Pacific context, um, you you know you spent much of your career working on labour standards and global supply chains. Um, so I wonder how the global aspect of modern slavery and human traffic affects our ability to deploy cutting edge technology to detect and disrupt it. Um, so in your opinion, what can be done to sort of guarantee local buy in here? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the first point that I wanted to make was really about I don't think that we could do it without technology. I think that the, the cross, you know, cross-country nature of global supply chains and the complexity of them mean that it's impossible for a person to do just on their own. Um, like when I was at my old company, I had a supply chain that was 10,000 factories and that's tier one factories. So then you can imagine, especially with the due diligence laws coming out of the EU where you know we need to take a whole supply chain approach. If you then bring in the tier twos, the tier threes, the tier fours, um, how how in the world could a small compliance team actually even start to look at that? Um, so it's it's something that we cannot do without technology. Um, at the same time, I think there's been a lot of work going into how do we make sure that the technology that we put in place um, isn't just replicating, let's say, a type of colonialism of you know the West comes in with their ideals and 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 pushes them, you know, onto onto the East or that, um, or also to make sure that the people on the ground are actually being impacted positively by this technology. Um, so it, I think it was in 2018 or 2017 there was something called the West Principles, which were developed, um, and those basically set out um, kind of the rules for engagement for technology in in the types of impacts that they're supposed to be having on global supply chains. Um, and I think they had some really good points coming out of that, which is essentially revolve around data privacy for for users, um, but also that whatever data that we're collecting on uh you know from users that we shouldn't be using this just because we think it looks nice or because we want to tell people about it in our global supply chain or in our um, modern slavery statements that we really have to make sure that this data is going back to help the workers in their supply chain in some way or that they're deriving some sort of benefit for it um, the other important point that came out of it was that if you are identifying situations of exploitation, that you're not just sitting on it, that you're actually acting on it and helping the people that have um, that have actually reported it. Um, and it is, I think it is a really big challenge when it comes to technology because unfortunately some of the data that you're getting um, isn't actually pinpointing a victim in a location because the data is aggregate. You may get you know, 50 questions back. And if the person chooses to remain anonymous, you may know that there's a problem there, but you can't actually find the victim. So I think that's one challenge for technology is that the people viewing the data may be, you know, a few continents removed from where that victim is. Or it could just be somebody misunderstanding the question. You don't really know. So I think the distance between, um, while technology provides this, this window into a universe um you don't always have direct access to help the victim in that other universe and at the same time um data can be manipulated you don't really know exactly what it's saying so i think um those are some of the challenges that i see with it um i mean the other one is really just about how you how do you how do you get that local engagement um I think doing more things in local languages is a really big thing. Um, most of the tools that I see out there related to modern slavery are not in the languages of the people who are probably on the ground and able to spot a lot of these cases or are the victims themselves. Um, so that's one thing is um, even like we work, we work on a lot of kind of global tools. And honestly, the language thing comes up more times than I'd like to admit, which is that to be able to switch something very quickly from one language into another, it can be a challenge. Um, the Wait, other one I, is- 
Yep. Sorry, um, um, I just want to pick you up there because it's we're we're sort of getting into our sort of Q and A time now. But actually, I think this one of our questions from the audience actually might be very pertinent here, uh, which is obviously many workers are from poor backgrounds. So how do they gain access to the technology you subscribe? You, mm -hmm. you're, you're describing. Yeah, so we, we've actually, um, so we've done a lot of work with um, like agricultural workers um, in, in, you know, developing and emerging economies. One way that we usually work, uh, reach them is through social media. Um, so even the workers may not be 100% literate, um, they, they still tend to use social media a lot to contact family and friends back home because it's the most economical way through which they can communicate and keep their social lives um, intact. Um, so that's been using like WeChat, um, WhatsApp, uh, Facebook, all of that has been a great way to reach migrant workers. Um, you know, having audio recordings instead of um, necessarily have them read something has, has also been important. Um, so we found ways around that using visuals. Um, yeah, having um, instead of having workers actually upload a written version of their contract, we've actually created a video function so that they can record the conversation between themselves and the broker at the village level. So there's different ways that you can get around it using technology. And I think that is one of the beauty of, of using technology is there's just so many things out there that are for so many different users that you can use. Great. Thanks very much, Leanne. That's that's really, really interesting and really good, I think, to see it from, you know, the sort of victim's perspective much more. Um, so I'd just like to bring in um, Nick um, here because um, one of the things uh, the audience is asking us is about um, using sort of language programs to identify MSA, modern slavery and human trafficking. So you talked about the use of technology and identifying language use. Um, could you give us an example, for instance, maybe about how criminal language was used to um, is detected by digital analytics? Um, or um, you know how unstructured text and police reports can be used. Yeah, so I mean it, it's it's similar to what Florian described earlier on. So we will train the model to identify the language that's used in um, in, in particular cases of modern slavery. The language that we're actually detecting is police language. So whatever language is used out there is kind of interpreted, if you like, for a police report. I think the point Florian made was absolutely right that that that, that it's got to be um, continually updated so we've got to continue to monitor the model and use um, expert because because it, even that even the police language about something will change right but, but we'll we, we need to continue to use the subject matter experts to monitor the model monitor the language that, 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 that we're using to ensure that and, and, and basically validate that the um the, the the events that are being identified are truly modern slavery events uh, but it's police language that's used in there and, and, and what it does and forgive me i'm not an expert by any means in this but there's a there's a there's a natural language scoring process so if it identifies a a a word that 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 belongs to a particular threat type, if you like, then it will identify similar words. And and, and in other sort of criminal language, a an example would be um, if if they, if they were identified, if, if the natural language processing was identifying a firearm, other criminals use terms such as a strap, for example, for a firearm, which might not be familiar to a lot of people, as referring to a gun. But the language will identify through the um, through the words that are used around it, through the context of that, that that relates to a gun, and then that will be assimilated, if you like, into the model. Um, but in terms of the, the modern slavery language, it, 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 it's obviously very early stages of the model. It is based on the language that we as police use at the moment um, linked to modern slavery, if, if that answers the question. Sure. I, actually, I would just be interested. Um, was um, was AI sort of used um, in your sort of operate in Operation Fort to help break up the network? No, it wasn't. I I I, uh, I wish it was. There was a lot of there was a lot that was done very manually. Um, and as Florian was speaking there about the use of um, the use of sort of analytical tools to be able to um, to, to sort of understand the threat. Of, you know. It reminded me that you know we had um, sort of up, up to 400 victims in Operation Fort, thousands of thousands of um, bank transactions. There was a lot of data that was held by banks um, that would have helped us understand the threat. If only it was 
sort of analyzed properly, if you like. So, so we analyze that data through f from those bank transactions manually through a, you know, a financial investigator. But it would have been really interesting to see how the bank's data overlaid on what was known to the police and how we could enrich our own uh, understanding of the threat. And that, I think, would help both the investigation, the safeguarding of the victims, but also the financial institutions and their ability to um, deal with the risk, if you like. So what, what I'm doing through the project to, to try and support that is a, a proof of concept to try and bring a bank on board to do a research, a, a sort of little research proposal to look at how um, the data from Opfort, how the West Midlands data as a whole, and how the bank data interact to help the to, to sort of help each other understand the threats that we face. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks very much, Nick. That's really interesting, and obviously, yeah, a, a huge, a hugely important case study there. Um, we're getting quite a lot of questions about GDPR, um, and Florian, maybe I could ask you. Um, do you find is, is GDPR um, a help or a hindrance when you're sort of gathering together large amounts of data and then using it obviously to identify patterns of modern slavery? Um, I wouldn't say it's uh, you know it's a hindrance. Um, it, it it creates certain requirements you know in in preconditions for for sharing data and for using data. But I think they're all very important requirements you know from an ethical point of view. So um, I think. GDPR, GDPR has been very important in, in, you know, bringing sort of the importance of data governance and uh, and sort of the you know appropriate basis for using data to the forefront of this debate. Um, I think one of the one of the challenges we see, and you know, GDPR is, is partly there to there to address this, is um, in in the context of modern slavery. Um, going back, you know, to some of the examples that Nick just mentioned. Um, Potentially, there's such a diverse range of data sources that are relevant. You know, for example, for you know, for an investigation, criminal investigation, right, including financial data, data from victims, um, you know, different sources, um, and the data owners are different. So, if you want to use the data from those different sources, you need to, um, you know, get an agreement to share data um, um, and uh, and to make data accessible. And I think one of the one of the challenges here is to find ways to ensure that data sharing occurs in a responsible manner um, and that concerns that different data owners have are being addressed and are being addressed in a transparent way and a, in a way that's that's verifiable and uh, GDPR you know helps to provide governance mechanisms to address some of that but it's it, I think it doesn't you know address all of it so there is a need beyond that to, to work on sort of governance frameworks that that make responsible data sharing um, uh, possible, you know, especially since often, you know, the same type of data can be used for positive um, purposes, but it could also potentially have, uh, there are also users that may have harmful impacts on, on victims and survivors, for example, if you think about, you know, financial data could have negative impacts on, on credit scoring, um, for example. So, yeah, so, so that's, that's what I would say on, on sort of on, on the topic, uh, the, the, the general importance of, of thinking about how to enable trust uh, for, for data sharing. Okay, great. Thanks, Florian. Um, and I think we've got time for one final question. And I think this is a good one for Leanne because it's more about how we can all help in this battle. Um, so with, with blockchain, essentially it's, it's a ledger which we can all contribute to. So how could civil society help? How can we help verify the information which we're using to um, tackle modern slavery? Sure. And I, I actually just wanted to add on also to that question on vulnerable workers and how we make technology available to them. Um, so I guess one of the important things to point out is that the mobile is actually probably the easiest way for most workers. So we, what we tend to do, it's, it was actually quite funny. The other day I saw my colleagues come back with a bag of phones and they had gone to this like dodgy store in Hong Kong and, and went and tried to find like the worst phones that they could possibly find um, and they wanted to make sure essentially that the platform was accessible on all different types of mobile phones um, because we do see that mobile phone penetration is probably the biggest um, compared to let's say computers or um, or other sorts of, of technology so mobile phones is like the, the number one way um, but it can be also through um, you know through a login through a desktop or something like that um, the other the other point uh, that I wanted to make was around um, 
So it was mobile phones. And also most of the times you actually don't want the worker to even think that they're accessing blockchain. So lots of people think blockchain is like this big complicated system and it's got to like extend everywhere and everyone has to be like somehow connected to it. But it's actually a backend piece of technology that you usually attach onto another piece of technology. So what we normally do is we're kind of like, um, we're almost like a parasite like we attach to whatever is already in existence there and we're ac we're able to basically add in our questions have the system in place but without the worker necessarily even understanding that they're interacting with blockchain because a lot of people just tend to get hung up on the word blockchain and then they think it's not accessible so we want to make basically like a seamless login for whatever system that the migrant worker is comfortable using because it's the adoption of that technology which is usually the biggest hurdle so the point is to try to make it as seamless as possible so we've also integrated to a lot of other platforms um, so the question on civil society, um, we've actually worked very positively with different NGOs that are on the ground in different places. Um, so we are working with an organization, for example, called Verificate in Thailand, um, which does a lot of the monitoring in the sugar harvest. Um, and so we've integrated with their platform, for instance, so that um, we're able to do the contract verification with the workers on the sugarcane fields, um, but at the same time, the workers aren't having to log into like 10 different platforms. Um, so that's one kind of positive way that we're working with civil society. Also in Bangladesh, um, we've been working very closely with Winrock um, and also with Elevate. Um, basically as a way of um, reaching out to workers on the ground and understanding from them what are the key steps um, or what are the key pieces of information that migrant workers need to know before they go. So NGOs often help us on the content side and understanding what are some of the barriers that, that migrant workers or other vulnerable groups are facing in relationship to modern slavery. Um, and we also use them oftentimes on the ground to help victims because as I said, at the end of the day, we're a tech company in Hong Kong. We're not we don't have 10,000 locations in different countries. Um, and so we really rely on our NGO partners to help us um, support victims. Um, the last point on that is probably just um, where we're thinking of going in the future is how do we create greater accountability mechanisms on the different levers in the supply chain? Um, so we're really interested in thinking about setting up a workplace blockchain system where we connect brands in the factories with trade unions or NGO partners on the ground with the workers so that we can get a real-time feed of what's happening in that factory um, and basically be able to understand better from those people on the ground whether there are any issues related to modern slavery or possibly other issues like child labor. Um, so yeah, different different ways that NGOs can play a part, um, but they're they're thanks. definitely a key part. Thanks. That's great. Well, thank you very much, and thanks to all our panelists. Would anyone like to add anything? Because I know this has been a really sort of fruitful discussion between all of you. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, so, Florin, any more to anything more to add? I think I mean there'll be lots more to say, but I think that would go you know would take more than two minutes. So I'll I'll leave mm -hmm. it at that. Thank you very and much. Lee, have you any 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 final any final word from you? I was going, I was going to say the same, Henry. If you've got another hour, then yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, not, but please do keep your questions coming in because we will go onto the FEMA Senate and we'll try and ask our panelists to um, answer as many of these as possible. So if you follow the link www.crimefinancial/femas-senate, uh, please post your questions there, and we'll try and get as many of these answered by our esteemed panelists as much as possible. Um, and I think that just leaves it for me to say thanks very much to everyone for joining us today. And thanks especially to our panel, Nick Dale, Superintendent at West Midlands Police, Leanne Melnick, Head of Human and Labour Rights Governance at DigiNext Solution, and Florian Ostman, who's Policy Theme Lead at the Alan Turing Institute. Thanks very much for joining us all today.